Hello students, Professor Watts here, and uh, it's time for another exciting foray into international finance. This time we're going to be taking a brief look at international stock markets. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to just take a quick look at some uh, data on the size and nature of some of the world's leading equity markets or stock markets. We'll delve a little bit into how those markets work, ownership of stocks from other countries. So. You know, how can people in the U.S. own foreign companies? How can people in foreign countries own U.S.-based stocks and so on? And then we'll close with a brief look at some equity benchmarks, which are indexes of the entire country's stock market. So you're probably familiar with the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500 indexes for the U.S. All major stock markets throughout the world have similar indexes, so we'll take a brief look at those. Okay, so... When we talk about a country's stock market, uh, one way to think about it is capitalization, market capitalization, sometimes referred to as market cap, which simply represents the total market value at current prices of all the shares of all the companies listed in that stock exchange or in that stock market. Here's a pretty impressive statistic. The total market cap of the top 80 stock exchanges in the world at the end of 2018 stood at 75 trillion dollars. So a lot of wealth, at least on paper, represented by stocks of companies throughout the world. Where does most of the wealth in the world exist? Well, it exists in the world's uh, greatest companies. So no surprise there. The five largest exchanges are going to be in mostly the US and then China. So we've got the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ in the US. Shanghai and Hong Kong and China and then Japan. So the biggest economies, not surprisingly, have the biggest stock markets with the most companies listed and the most market capitalization. Now, another thing we're interested in when it comes to assessing international stock markets is liquidity. You probably know what liquidity means from your finance and accounting classes. We're talking about how hard or easy is it to convert an asset into cash. So when we're talking about stock, liquidity means how easy can it be sold and converted into cash. So to think about the kind of overall liquidity of a stock market, we want to think about the turnover ratio. That's a ratio of transactions in a stock market divided by market cap. So basically how much of the market cap turns over in a given time frame. Usually it's going to be a year. So higher turnover ratios means there's a lot more selling and buying activity in those stocks, those companies, and a lower turnover ratio means there's not as much buying and selling activity. So you want to look for numbers here, in the, at least in the double digits. Uh, so you, you're going to see some exchanges of well over 100%, meaning that there's more gross buying and selling than there is uh, market cap in the index. Uh, some are going to be pretty close to zero, which means shares are hardly ever getting bought or sold. So a uh, healthy number would probably be some, something in the middle of that, 20 30 50%. The reason having a very low turnover is a bad sign for a stock market is that it indicates that it might be hard to liquidate shares if needed. If there's just not a lot of buying and selling activity on a given day, you, well, you might be hard pressed to find a buyer for shares at something close to what you think is the market price. You might have to do some deep discounting of the price in order to find buyers. If the turnover ratio is really high, 100% plus, that indicates that that's a hot market with probably a lot of speculative activity. People are really eager to get their hands on shares. It's really easy to sell. There's a lot of buying and selling. Probably a sign of a, a booming market or growing emerging market where there's lots of opportunities being created. Okay, and then the final thing we want to look at just kind of to size up a international stock market is market concentration. How much is the market cap spread out amongst all the listed companies? And this tells us kind of how, how thick, how developed is that economy, basically. Because if this concentration number is high, that tells us that a very small number of businesses dominate the market cap of that country's stock market. If this number is small, that means there's lots and lots and lots of businesses that are large and have high stock values. The measure we're going to be looking at here is the market cap of the largest 10 companies divided by the total market cap. And these numbers can range from something close to 100%. So 10 companies basically represent the entire stock market. That's the case here in this Budapest Stock Exchange. Versus something like a, a developed economy like London with lots and lots and lots of large companies listed. The largest 10 companies there are only holding about 30% of the total market cap. And we can jump into the textbook here and they have a nice chart that shows us both the, uh, the turnover 
statistic and then the concentration of the top 10 companies. So here we go. Bermuda has a, uh, top 10 companies are 99% of that stock market's cap. So that basically tells you that's a very, very small economy, very small stock market. There's probably not much more than 10 companies listed there. And the turnover is also very low at 1.49%. So they're not being bought and sold very often. So there's going to be pretty illiquid stocks and a very small economy. Let's look at Australia on the other hand. We've got a uh, turnover of 65%. So very healthy buying and selling and the concentration is only 39%. So the top 10 companies in Australia only represent 39% of the total stock market value there. So that tells you there's lots and lots and lots of other companies with significant uh, stock valuations. So good way to kind of size up uh, the stock market of a particular country in the uh, textbook. Boy, it lists a lot of them here. And if you're wondering what these data look like for the United States, I was able to find this by searching online. Strangely, it's not in that uh, textbook chart, but that's okay. So I found um, here from uh, Plant Moran, the top 10 holdings for the S&P 500 in the U.S. Uh, it's, been in, it's been growing quite a bit in recent years, but it's still below 30%. It was as low as something about like 17% here in uh, 20, 2015, 2016. So we've had some ups and downs, but um, and, and some people are worried about this concentration. All the all the values being created by a small number of companies is, is kind of the worry there. And that means maybe our stock market is kind of tilted towards a few, a few high impact players. But um, I think that's still relatively low on a global basis. It shows us a pretty large and robust industrial sector and as far as turnover ratio for the United States, I was able to find that through the Federal Reserve Economic Data site. And you can see that's been quite high in the U.S. here in, the, in late 2008 when everybody was selling. Uh, stock market crash, that goes as high as almost uh, 300%. And then it comes back down and we're now in the range of 133% here for 2017. That's as far as their data goes. We've been um, something close to or above 100% here, for, though, for decades in the United States. So very active, very liquid markets, as you might expect for us in the U.S. Okay, now I'm just going to talk very briefly about this because I don't want this to be a lecture on how stock markets work. I think that's a topic for another class. You may have learned a little bit about it elsewhere. But we'll just mention a few key terms here. There's primary and secondary markets in all financial securities, as you're probably aware. Primary markets are where those securities originate and where the initial p purchasers purchase a security. So if a company issues stock in a primary market, it's either going to be an IPO, an initial public offering, or a seasoned offering, a company that already has issued stock, issuing additional shares of new stock in order to raise capital to finance its operations. Most trading in stocks is in the secondary market where people who bought them are just trading and cashing out and selling them to somebody else. Okay, so we want to know the difference there between those concepts, primary market, secondary market. The vast majority of stock trading is going to be secondary market activities. Now, the textbook has some details about how orders work and what kind of uh, markets you're dealing with, whether it's a dealer or agency. This is uh, kind of minutia, frankly, and if you're interested, um, I encourage you to learn about that, but it's it's not crucial to know, so I'm just going to move past that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, consolidation. There are about 80 major national stock markets, and this number has been decreasing over time for some very strong underlying economic reasons. If every country has its own stock market and people want to engage in international stock holding, well, you have to work within every country's stock exchange, and you might have to have a uh, brokerage account within each country or you know, some relationship, a bank or a brokerage house that's a member of the stock exchange within each country. And that just increases transactions costs and makes life difficult for investors. And then, of course, you also have to deal with the um, multiple layers of transactions in terms of brokers and dealers and agents in order to buy and sell a well-diversified, globally diversified portfolio of equity investments. So the fewer exchanges there are, the easier it is for people to deal and invest shares globally. So there's been movements to uh, merge stock exchanges internationally. There has been a lot of um, cross-border acquisition amongst these kind of financial firms that run stock exchanges. You might have seen that the New York Stock Exchange is actually called the NYSE Euro next. It's uh, bought and merged with several European 
stock exchanges. They haven't necessarily integrated the functions of those exchanges, but that's uh, maybe on their agenda into the future. And the key is uh, lowering the transactions costs of trading and investing and um, increasing the speed and efficiency with which trades can be undertaken. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the rationale for international investment. And I I've, I've hope you've discussed this in some of your investing classes, so I'll just give a brief kind of high-level overview here. The benefits of international diversification are pretty obvious. If you think about, well, what countries are going to experience the, the most growth in their economies, and therefore what companies are poised to have the highest rates of profitability? Well, if you think about mature, rich countries like the United States, you know, we've we still have economic growth, but our biggest growth days are behind us because we are a highly developed, highly mature economy. So we don't expect to see very large growth rates. And it's kind of, I like to analogize this to if you're looking at um, a 70-year-old man versus a 10-year-old child, who's going to grow faster? Well, the 10-year-old kid's going to grow faster, yeah. especially if you feed him a lot of milk so that kid can put on muscle and, and really grow and develop because there's potential there. The 70-year-old person is just maybe just hoping to uh, hold on to the um, you know, muscle mass and bone density he's already got. So the developing economies of the world are kind of like children in that sense, where they have a lot of potential in front of them and a lot of room to grow. And so that's where the high growth rates are going to be, and that's where the really high profit rates are going to be across the board. Now, in the developed economies, we'll have particular companies with really high growth potential in certain sectors, like the tech sector, for example. But we're probably not going to see sustained double-digit rates of real GDP growth. Uh, so we're not going to see widespread growth in profitability for companies across different sectors of the economy in the same way that developing economies are. So uh, people want a piece of the action, so to speak, in owning stock in companies in those developing economies. So the, the benefits of that international diversification are just huge. So we might label that kind of a demand side rationale for international equity investment, uh, people wanting to own foreign stocks. And then the other factors listed here, we might kind of call them supply side factors. There's a liberalization of capital markets, meaning it's easier for money to flow into these economies. The computerized trading networks that have been developed and implemented make the cost of acquiring and trading stocks lower. And then uh, multinational companies also realize that it, it might behoove them to be active in foreign uh, equity markets to list their shares overseas in order to uh, participate in those capital markets. So foreign companies can list their shares in the United States, for example, and then they can have seasoned offerings in the United States in order to tap U.S. savers funds to raise equity capital in order to expand operations either for their U.S. subsidiaries or just to fund their overall operational activities. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, foreign companies can list shares in the U.S. and uh, American companies can list abroad, and you know, the companies can just list their shares in different countries for various reasons. This is referred to as cross-listing, and well, what are some of the rationales for cross-listing of shares? Well, as I was just mentioning, uh, you get access to a foreign country's capital base, you get access to a new group of investors, you can list new shares, raise capital. Uh, marketing is kind of a, an aspect of this. Establish name recognition in a new capital market. If people are buying stock in your company, they might become more interested in your products. And corporate governance is a big deal. If companies, there's different tiers, and we'll look at this here in a minute, but if foreign companies list in the United States, for example, they can subject themselves to U.S. financial regulations, which are largely viewed as more stringent than the regulations of certain home countries for these companies. So that indicates to investors that the quality of the data that those companies are presenting is going to be better, and that might indicate uh, more verifiable data on their financial performance results. That alone might need, lead to higher share prices than if they just listed in their home country, even if they don't do any other profit-enhancing activities. Yankee stock offerings. What is a Yankee stock offering? Well, we saw this kind of terminology last week when we were looking at uh, international bond markets. You had uh, Yankee bonds, foreign companies issue bonds in the U.S., samurai bonds, foreign companies issue bonds in Japan. Same phenomenon here with respect to Yankee stock offerings. Foreign companies sell shares in the U.S., lists and sell shares in the U.S. And as our textbook indicates, there's a few major factors 
behind this. It's a phenomenon that started off in the mid-1990s. A lot of uh, companies in formerly socialist countries get privatized. They don't have mature capital markets in their own countries, so they come to the world's biggest capital market to raise funds. It makes sense. Rapid growth in economies of developing countries. Again, there's just not enough capital locally to satisfy the needs of these companies, so they come to the world's most mature capital market, where a lot of American investors, having learned the value of diversification of their portfolio, are pretty eager to move at least part of their portfolio into uh, international equities. Particularly with Mexican companies after NAFTA, looking to do a lot more uh, business across the border with the United States. So again, where do they go to raise capital for that? The U.S. equity market. American depository receipts would be a particular instance of the phenomenon of cross-listing, and this is specifically applies to foreign companies that want to list shares in the United States. Let's take a look at a very short and informative video about ADRs. All right, so here's a brief summary of what ADRs can look like. As the video mentioned there, we have level one, two, and three. There's various regulatory requirements that a firm can choose to meet or not, depending on where the firm wants these shares to trade and what uh, level of exposure to United States financial regulations they seek. Now, in a related note to ADRs, uh, American Depository Receipts is G uh, GRS, or Global Registered Shares. And these are a little bit more rare, but this is possibly the wave of the future, as uh, GRS are stocks that uh, sell across borders. So we're not just talking about stocks that are issued in a home country and then you can purchase them through a trustee, basically a depository trustee, the way that ADRs work. No, these are shares that are listed and sell in multiple countries at the same time with no middlemen, so to speak, no, no trustees holding the shares for the buyers, global registered shares. Fully fungible, that means you can purchase it in New York and then sell it in London. Of course, you're going to purchase it in dollars and then sell it in pounds if you do that maneuver. So you're going to see arbitrage uh, opportunities potentially, and you're going to see arbitrage ensuring that the price of the share across two different borders matches the exchange rate across those two borders. So, for example, let's say a uh, GRS firm stock sells in New York for $100. And if the dollar pound exchange rate is a dollar fifty per pound, well, that share's price in London is going to be pretty darn close to one hundred and fifty dollars. Otherwise, there's going to be arbitrage opportunities to buy in New York, sell in London, or vice versa. Okay, let's close out this uh, brief look at international equities by looking at equity benchmarks or indexes. An index of stocks traded on the secondary exchange of a country, and you're probably familiar with. Uh, these for the United States. They get a lot of play in the financial news. These are usually reported on a daily basis. So we're talking about things like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500 Index, the NASDAQ Index, and so on. And these are basically kind of barometers of the direction of a com country stock market in terms of valuations. Is the stock market going up or down? Well, we want to look at a combined index of a large pool of the companies in that country. A representative index is one that includes either a lot of companies and or a lot of the market cap for that particular country. For the United States, probably the, one of our most famous indices is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but you know that's only 30 companies. And so that's not going to include either most of the companies, most of the large publicly traded companies in the U.S., or most of the market cap, the U.S. stock market. And let me just show you what I mean there. So I just did a quick Google search on this. I, I plugged in Dow Jones Industrial Average Market Cap, and that's only $8.3 versus uh, a much broader index of the entire U.S. stock market, the Wilshire 5000, which is the top 5,000 publicly traded firms in the U.S. And notice that it's got a market cap of about $41 trillion. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average at $8.33 in total market value of all the stocks in it Let's divide that into the Wilshire 5000 market cap. That's only 20% of the value of U.S. equities. 
So that's kind of a narrow index and maybe not the most useful one. It does it is kind of a legacy index. It's our oldest stock index. It goes back as if I remember right to the 1890s, but uh, maybe not the most relevant index to look at. The S&P 500 is a much better index to use when you're thinking about the um, at least the large companies in the U.S. And if I remember right, it captures about uh, 80%. It's it's got 31.6 trillion divided by the 40.8 trillion total. So it yeah 77%. So something like 77 80% of the value of U.S. equities is captured by the S&P 500. So that's a much better index. So. I won't get into the details of index math and weighting. Um, you can look into that if you're interested. So we look at those index indices and see if their value is going up or down. And that's kind of a barometer of expectations about how things are going to go in an economy. You know, the stock market crashes usually uh, right before or right at the beginning of a recession. And then if the perception is the economy is going to improve, the stock market will bounce right back. We've seen we've been on that roller coaster here. I'm um, speaking here in uh, late March 2021. You know, we've we've been on that roller coaster over the last year, so we all have a pretty good idea of what that stock market index means, or at least means to the business world. So, all we're looking at here is that well, every country that has a stock market has a similar stock market index. So here's a map that shows some of the major ones for the uh, bigger economies. Of course, here there the, we see the U.S. We've got the Dow Jones Industrials, we've got the S&P 500, we've got the NASDAQ 100. Now, sometimes you hear in the in the financial news reporting, you know, Britain has the FTSE 100, France has the CAC, Germany has the DAX. Okay. So all the major countries with their major stock markets are going to have their own indices. We can wrap up by taking a quick look at those indices and, and what they've been doing uh, recently. The Wall Street Journal markets page shows uh, major global indices, so we can look at the Dow Jones, the United States. Uh, I'd like the S&P 500 better, and uh, you know, let's look at that on a one-year basis. Up pretty strongly over the last year, almost 50%. You know, we if we go back to three years, we can see the the crash here with the COVID lockdowns, uh, but, uh, March 2020, but then the immediate rebound, and then a pretty much uninterrupted upward trend since then. Let's look at uh, some of the other world's large indexes. Similar story played out in China. They had a big drop here in early 2020, but then strong recovery since then. We can look at the UK. Similar story, not as much of a recovery. Maybe they're hit harder by the virus. So stock market indexes or indices, you know, every major country's got them. And it's a good thing to know in terms of gauging the performance of individual countries and the global economy. Okay, so that'll wrap it for our brief look here at uh, global stock markets. Hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.